Good morning. We are so grateful for you to be here with us today. We do have a few guests with us, and we're thankful that you've taken the time to come and worship God with us uh, today. Very grateful for that. Going to embark upon a subject that's going to take up not only today's lesson, but I will do part two uh, next Sunday morning, Lord willing, as well. And obviously, as you can see in the outline in the bulletin that is uh, before you, that I do want to talk about adversity. When adversity strikes. Now, let me say in the very beginning, it is never our place to try to answer in the place of God. God is a sovereign being, the sovereign being of the universe, of which does not need, nor does he ask us, to try to make excuses for God and whatever his decisions and his power and might that he so wishes to do. We find ourselves at times, though, wondering because of the various problems, conditions, and adversities that take place in life, and it is a common question that we ask, why God? Why, God, do you let these things happen? There are various forms of adversity that cause suffering among humanity. We see it about us all the time. Not just historically, though we know it historically, but in our own times. One need only to listen to the news, read the newspaper, or sometimes not so very far away from any one of us. And it might be natural disasters in the form of tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, and so forth. Sickness and disease, serious ailments, at times even ep epidemics, even there are times, sadly, that there are cultures that face these things pandemically as well. Thousands and thousands of people, we know, of situations that have died. Wars, oppression, affliction, persecution caused by others upon even those who are innocent and sometimes as we've been talking about in the James class on Sunday morning, the righteous. Then there are times that there are accidents, unfortunate mistakes that can have very serious effects that, again, can befall us, even at times when we least expect it. And any of these things can result in the loss of property, harm or injury, and even death. We're taken back by this. So we ask the question, is life fair? Why is this happening in my life? Who is responsible when adversity strikes? Now it is purely a matter of perspective and depends on the circumstance at times. And one of the reasons that I wanted is to go ahead and have as our scripture reading today out of the book of Job is because we remember Job's friends and why we read this morning from that text in chapter 8. But as we remember Job's friends, and I just want to remind you that what you find again in Job 8 and verses 5 and 6, and here is this appeal that is being made to Job who has just suffered a great amount of adversity, calamity in his life, and we find in this case that Bildad says, If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now He would await for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. Two things there. One, though Bildad does not come out and say it directly in some kind of accusation or opposition to God, he is assuming, or one can assume by virtue of his words, that somehow God is asleep or not apparent or awake in the life of Job. And that's just as wrong as wrong can be. But number two, as we're going to see a little bit later on, 
that somehow that the calamity that has befallen Job is Job's fault, his mistake, as we're going to see, that in chapter 4, chapter 8, and chapter 11, and these are the discourses of his three friends, what's their basic message to Job? Job, you've done something wrong. You need to repent. I want to ask, how many times do we see people in this world? Maybe how many times do we look in our own lives personally and things aren't going the way that we'd like them to go? In fact, they may be very difficult, very challenging, and it could be in our health, and it could be in our jobs, it could be in our family relationships. And we look to God and we say, what did I do wrong? Has that ever been any, any of us? I think it's a natural thing to do. Life seems fair when troubles are at minimum. But that is extremely narrow when you think about it. Because when life is going well for us, we think that everything is just really great. That is a narrow-minded perspective. Because I'll tell you, somewhere, someone else is experiencing some kind of serious trouble. Do you suppose that there are people, in even our own culture, our own society, places perhaps in our own communities right here, that are suffering adversity? And do you think there are people suffering adversity on the other side of the planet? Of course. So it's a matter of one's perspective. Notwithstanding, we're going to see that there is a positive side of the suffering too, and that's going to be next Lord's Day, next Sunday, Lord willing. That is, we're going to talk about the positive things that we can get from suffering. So we'll deal with that then. But I have heard comments through the years, and even recent comments from time to time, that I find troubling, perhaps even wrong, and at best ill-advised. And again, it comes down to this matter that when adversity strikes, there are so many times that people want to somehow assign blame to God in all of this matter. And it is here we have to be very, very careful. Now again, we make no apologies for God, and I'm going to be reemphasizing that in a moment. So what becomes the natural question when adversity strikes? And it comes down to this question of who is to blame? And you talk about perspective. Maybe we look at it and, and sometimes we become very skeptical and very cynical of our society, of our government. How many of us here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm just thinking, how many of us are right now are very, very skeptical and very cynical of our government, of our society, of our politics, of uh, just a lot of things? How many of us as Christians are, have become very cynical because of the moral standing of the world, the direction that we seem to be going? And we look at this and we say, we say, is this what's causing the problems? Is this why there's adversity? Is this why that, that you have these, these cataclysmic things take place because of, because of humans' poor choices? You know what? Historically, that's been the case at times. And again, who are we to tell God how he is to be controlled? But who's to blame? It is very common and equally sad that at times people indiscriminately charge God when disaster, affliction, or calamity befalls humanity. And many of you have heard me say this a lot of times through the years. And I'll tell you that when you look at the calamity, when you look at the adversities that strike, all I can tell you sadly is there's many times God gets blamed for a lot of things. Which he should not. And I'm not saying that he's not in control. I'm not saying that he couldn't step in if he wanted to and to change it. Does God have the ability to do that? We understand that. But who are we to try to determine when God should do it and when he shouldn't do it? Again, we, we use the phrase that's become very, very popular here of, of recent. When it, when it comes to those kinds of decisions of what God should do and when and what he should do and how he should do it is way above our pay grade. Way above. I think one of the key factors that we've got to remember is knowing the difference in what God orders and what God allows. I want us to really think about that. There is a key difference in what it is that God orders 
at his best when he says, this is what it is. Does God have the right, the power, the authority, the sovereignty to order whatever he desires to order? He has that right. But there can be a difference in what it is that God will allow. And there are sometimes that there may be things that happen that God, yes, allows. And yes, he's in control. But because of a couple of matters. One, because he set this universe in this world, even when you talk about it physically, empirically, biologically, and all those kinds of things. He set that in order many, many, many eons ago. And I'll tell you what, we're going to have various kinds of calamitous situations. And he allows it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he always has ordered it. Not that he can't. So I want us to think about this in a couple of ways very briefly. And again, so there's this difference between what God orders and what God allows. And I cannot say this enough this morning that God is the sovereign ruler. He is the creator and the so sovereign ruler of the universe. And we are in no position to try to make excuses for him, even when our skeptical friends and neighbors and say, well, if there is a God, then why are there bad things and evil and calamitous adverse things that happen? And do we find that we have to try to make excuses for God? No, let's not do that. People need to come to the realization that it is God's universe, it is his creation, and it is God's right to act in any way he so desires. We struggle with that. We really do. Now, as I thought about this, and there are just several, I want to go through these somewhat briefly as we think about again, you know, because of the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the tsunamis and the hurricanes and the floods and the wars that have plagued the world from the beginning of time. But does that mean that they are always at the order of the behest of God? And it is here again that we need to be careful. And so as I thought about this, though, from a biblical standpoint, there have been some exceptional situations that God ordered. And we know these. We study these all the time. In Bible classes, we make the points in sermons. We in our own personal study. And you think about this, and there are some exceptional situations in biblical times where God, where God ordered things. You think about the flood in the days of Noah. And we look at the condition of the world, and this was God's decision. And we find in Genesis chapter 6 that God looks down upon humanity, and the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. We discussed it in Bible class this morning, though, that even in that situation, God not only commissions Noah to build an ark, but what else does he commission Noah to do? To preach to these people. Fred brought out the point this morning where we were talking about that point. It came to Fred's mind as well. But for 120 years, what has Noah tried to get the world to do? The world where it was in that little Mesopotamian valley, what is Noah trying to get the world to do? Repent. Change. Come to its senses. It won't, it won't do it. And so what does God order? Well, the rains came down and the floods came up as we teach our children the song. And we understand then that the flood in the days of Noah, at least we read about that account in Genesis uh, chapter 6 through 8. This is something that was an exceptional situation. Indeed, God ordered that. We see a lot of examples like that. It's the same thing. I, I brought it briefly in the class this morning in Genesis 19 and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. But even there, when God has decided that he is going to strike these cities, destroy them because of their profligacy, because of their immorality, an immorality that was just... It was reprehensible. And we look at this and see how bad it was. And yet here is Abraham saying to God, God, if you could find 50, 40, 30, find 10 righteous people, you spare the city. And messengers are sent to the city and it's a, to deliver Lot and his family. But not 10 righteous people could be found in these thousands and thousands of people. And so what does God order? Fire and brimstone. And destroys the city. I want to ask you, does God have the right to do that? The people that struggle with that. Why did God mo send Moses to Pharaoh? A simple message. Oh, we know that, that what it was going to be involved and how challenging it would be to Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt, this most powerful nation on the planet at the time. But here's the simple message of Moses to Pharaoh. Let my people go. 
And Pharaoh says, I don't know your God, neither will I let the people go. And so what does God order upon each ten plagues? And even one by one, I want to ask you, after each plague, did Pharaoh have opportunity to change his mind, to soften his heart, and let the people go, and they would have been spared. But wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. We looked at these things and from the destruction of Jerusalem historically a couple times in 586 B.C. And they were on over and over and over. And if they would have repented, God would have spared them. The same thing when Jesus warns about it in the later destruction. Another destruction of Jerusalem in the temple in AD 70. Jesus there, he warns and warns the people. A message is being preached to the Jewish people to change, to change, to turn back to God. But I tell you what, it's God that orders these things. And they were so predicted and prophesied. Now we ask the question about, we ask the question this, how do we know? How do we know that these things were the direct result of God's actions on a sinful and rebellious people? In these cases, because the biblical record says so, the biblical record points out, this is what God did. And he told men like Noah. And he told the messengers in, the, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's telling Moses to tell all these, you warn them. And if they'll do the right thing, then God will hold back. But there are times historically we know that's exactly what God did. But in all these cases, God's ample warning and opportunity... For repentance and deliverance was there. It was which God was willing to change himself, his own mind, to avert the calamitous action. You know, we have a great example of that. And most of you are very familiar with the little book of Jonah, the minor prophets. Jonah. And God commissions a prophet by the name of Jonah to go to Nineveh. This capital city, a Gentile nation of Assyria, wicked, atrocious. In fact, we know through the historical record, not just the biblical record, but what we found archaeologically, the biblical record, the atrocities of the Assyrians in their capital city and with their king was so bad, the deprivation was so bad. We understand why Jonah went the opposite way. He tried to run away from his task in chapter 1. But finally, when he goes through his own series of events, and by the way, does God have the right and the ability to make a big fish and allow it to swallow a prophet and for him to survive three days in the belly of the big fish and live to tell about it and then go do what he's supposed to do? The biblical record. And I've said this before because when we're talking about God, God, it is his universe, his world. And the God that could speak this world into existence could certainly make a man survive in the belly of that great big fish. In fact, I've often said if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the big fish, we'd believe it. But we didn't, it didn't say that. <laughs> But it's very interesting. There's only one prophecy in the book of Jonah. Only one. It's not even a messianic prophecy. It was the prophecy once Jonah got to Nineveh. And he, he's able to talk to the king, the leading people of, in, in Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And he, he tells them that, yeah, they need to repent. But here was the prophecy that God is going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. But I asked him. At that time, did God, when 40 days came, did God destroy the city? He did not. And you know why? In fact, it states in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10, after Jonah preaches and even this heathen Gentile king comes to his senses and repents, and in Jonah 3, 10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Which I'll tell you tells me something. Does God have the ability to change his heart or his mind when he sees genuine repentance? And as the passage that we talked about in the Bible class this morning in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, that the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some men count slowness. That is, God, you can count on God of what he says. 
but he is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I love the message you find in Ezekiel 33 that God takes no pleasure in, in the destruction or in the judgment against the wicked. He takes no pleasure in that. But what does he want people to do? Repent and turn. So I thought about these exceptional situations. God in his sovereignty had the right to do that. And then you talk about God's right and sovereignty. And then there were some death sentences that God ordered. That we see in the Bible. Most of us are very familiar going back to the Old Testament, the Old Law. And who were Nadab and Abihu? They were the sons of the, of the high priest. And the high priest at the time was none other than Aaron, the brother of Moses. And here is Nadab and Abihu, priests, the sons of Aaron, the nephews of Moses. And, but, but it was very clear that in the law that there was a certain type of fire they were used to, to fire to use of the censers. Of and the sacrifices that they would make. And not to offer this strange or this un, strange or unauthorized fire. And here's what they do. They ignore that. And they go ahead and act outside of what God said to do and how to do it. And what did the Lord order? To fire to come down from heaven and consume. I think we struggle with those things at time to time. But I want to ask you. God in his sovereignty, does he have the right to order that? Well, he did. How many of us are familiar with the story of Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6? And the law was very clear that when he came to the children of Israel, that you were not in the, in, in the handling of the Ark of the Covenant and transporting the Ark of the Covenant. What would happen if any person of the children of Israel, if anyone would touch the ark, what would happen to them? They would be struck dead. That's what it said. It had been in the hands of the Philistines for a while. They had captured the ark. They're moving it all over the place. You know, the law didn't pertain to them, by the way. They didn't die, but you know what the Lord did? He struck the nation with sickness while, as long as they had the ark, and they finally said, you know what? Got a message to David. Take it back. We don't want it anymore. But not consulting the law. This ark is already upon a cart and it's going to transport it and they're going through this threshing floor and there begins to tip over. And Uzzah, just a natural reaction, Uzzah, is, he's, he's of the children of Israel and it reaches forth and he pushes the ark to upright it on the cart and what happens? Struck dead. In violation of the law. Special death circumstances. We find them over and over. We find them in the New Testament as well. When Ananias and Sapphira sold the possession of lied to God, lied to the Holy Spirit, you find it in Acts chapter 5. And when they held back that part, but lied about it when it was their right to do with whatever they wanted to do with it, but when they lied about it, wanting people to think this is what we gave, we gave it all and so forth, we understand when they were put to the test. And even there... Peter asked Ananias, did you do such and such? And he says, yes. He says, you have not lied to men but to God. And he was struck dead. They carried his body away. And then his wife's fire, she comes in. And she's asked, is this what happened? And she says the same thing, sadly, that her husband did. And was told that these men that carried your husband's body off will now carry yours off. And she was struck dead. I want to ask, does God in his sovereignty have the right to do that? I'll tell you one thing it says. It says that right at the end of that section in Acts 5, then fear came upon the whole church. I would think so. These are special circumstances. When King Herod in Acts chapter 12. And he'd already caused the death of James, the first apostle, to be martyred, to be put to death. And he's getting ready to do the same thing with the apostle Peter. He wants to kill him with the sword. But here is Herod. And now all the people, because Herod, in thinking in his own glory and grandeur and how great he is, and as he's talking to the people, and the people look to Herod, this Jewish king, and they said, the people said, Oh, the voice of God and not of man. And he's taking the, and God decides to use his, him as an example. And King Herod finds himself immediately afflicted with intestinal worms that eat him up, eat him to death. 
And mainly because he did not give God the glory. We struggle with these kinds of passages from time to time. There are things that God has ordered historically. And again, we have to be very, very careful of saying, well, what God will or will not do today. But the big issue becomes, what do we do when adversity or difficulties and challenges tempted and tried were off made of wonders, we say, what do we do when this adversity strikes? Then I got to thinking about this, that what about Job? We have that reading about Job. And I just want you to think, most of us are very familiar with the story, but this is an extremely exceptional case. And you have this very unusual circumstance in Job chapter 1. He seems to be, Job seemed to have lived during the patriarchal age. We're a little uncertain to the authorship of the book of Job. Many conservative scholars attribute it to Moses of writing it. There's no doubt that, that we're talking about a patriarchal period of time uh, before Moses and the law of Moses. But here is Job, this good man, a righteous man, a man of faith, and very blessed by God. Very blessed by God. Family, children, married man with children, with servants, with, with herds and flocks and property and servants and, and all of this. And the strange part is it says there came this period of time when the sons of men came to present themselves before God. And whatever this scenario is that these sons of men and doing this, it's kind of almost like what we read in even in the, the, in the sons of men, the sons of God, are spoken of in Genesis chapter 4 and 5. In very unusual circumstances, but they present themselves before God, but who is there as well as Satan? Remember about a month ago, I preached a lesson on making a deal with the devil, and we talked about this diabolos, this diabolical one. And here he is. And God says to him in Job 1.8, for example, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says to him, Your servant Job is so faithful to you and he's so good. He was a man that made his offerings, made his sacrifices, even did them for his children, lest they become forgetful in their responsibility. And, and you just see this character of Job, but here is Satan saying, you know what you've done? You've protected him. You've built a hedge around him, and you've done so much for him. But you know, you take away, you start taking away of all these blessings you give him, and you watch, and Satan is, is convinced he'll curse you. And amazingly, and I'll tell you what, we struggle with this. God says, okay. I'll let you touch his family and his goods, the sheep, the flocks, the herds. Don't touch his body, his person. And so we, we read that, and what happens? I mean, his flocks and his herds, they're destroyed. These, these calamitous situations come up. Servants are killed. His, his children are together having a feast in the oldest brother's house. And this, this wind comes through and the roof falls in and his children are killed. And, and Job is hearing one by one by one calamity after another. And he looks at all of, of this and he does not curse God. What an exceptional situation it is. But Satan is trying to attack his character, his property, his family. But the scripture says in all of this, Job did not sin. So some time passes. And the sons of men present themselves before God here. And here's Satan again. And God says, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, you know what? Let me affect his body, his personal body. And then you see what happens. God says, you may do that, but you just can't take his life. Don't kill him. You can't take his life. And there he afflicted him with a malady, with a problem. And it says that with these boils and these open sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head, finally sitting down and with clay, broken clay jars, and he is scraping himself, sitting there in this miserable condition. 
We already know what's happened to his servants, his family, his flocks, his herds. We already see what has happened, and he remains spiritually integrous. And now this is happening, and then in all of this, his wife is still there. What does she say? Job, curse God and die. And he told her, you act and you speak as one of the foolish women. And the attitude of Job is, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He says, naked we come into this world, and naked we will leave this world. He gives, takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, he did not sin. Oh, he was confused. He couldn't understand. He was asking his wife questions. And then out of all of that, he's got a wife that says, curse God and die. And then we, he's got these three friends, and they, they've been friends for a long time. When you look at the personalities of, of Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, and, and here they are. Where they're looking at this and saying, as we've already mentioned, Job, this has all happened because you've done something wrong and you're not being honest about it. Open up and say what it is. Repent and change. And you have this running scenario, this dialogue that goes on between Job and his three, three friends. And I'm going to tell you what, not too far from what happens a lot in today's world when people are trying to explain certain things away in this life, these three friends of Job were nothing more than psycho babblers. And if they had had opportunity, they would have probably written their paperback books back then too. Self-help books. That have really no value. I think the question that I ask all the time when it comes to this is yes, we may ask the question of why? Why, God? What about Job? But why has this been recorded? Why is this in the canon of Scripture? And, brethren, I believe that it was recorded, it was recorded by God's providence for our learning. You know, when we so often quote Romans 15 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul said that whatever things were written before time, he's talking about that Old Testament, that Bible, whatever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Do we learn great lessons about patience when we study and when we meditate upon a book like Job? I heard a preacher in time preach a sermon with Job and the title of the sermon was, Hang in there, Job. <laughs> and we don't want to make flippant of such a serious matter, but hang in there. You talk about patience. You talk about endurance. And now we're talking about that in the adult Bible class because of, of James chapter 5 and verse 11. Remember the steadfastness. Remember the patience of Job. That has been written for our learning. Passage that's not in your outline, but I want you to write it in there. If you can. And that's Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 11. I meant to insert that in there. I knew I was going to deal with it, and then I just totally forgot. But the wise man says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, as he's talking about life and the vanity of life when God's not at the center. And there are a lot of inequities, a lot of unfair things that take place. And he makes this observation, and it is so true. In Ecclesiastes 9-11, again, I saw that under the sun, we're living life under the sun. That under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. Have you ever been just utterly surprised? When you want to talk about athletics, he talks about race. But in some athletic endeavor, that some team that clearly has been the very, very, very best team, great record, things going well, and all it does is come to a simple playoff game on a Saturday and a Sunday, and they fall. And maybe 9 out of 10 times, maybe 99 out of 100 times, they would have won that game. Doesn't always work that way, does it? A lot of reasons, I suppose, for that. But what he wants us to, us to see 
is that in our minds sometimes we think, well, no, those that are intelligent, those that are wealthy, those that are wise, those that are that are physically fit, those that have all of these seeming advantages, you have to understand that sometimes in the inequities of life, it doesn't turn out the way that we think it ought to turn out or is going to turn out. And that's humbling. And we need to be humble. We need to be taught by that. Because of what? Time and chance happen to them all. And I believe that that certainly was a case, even as we saw, as man was a free moral agent from the beginning of time. The reason why things are the way they are is because God has given us the ability to make choices make choices in this life and when you put the human factor into it and the choices that we make you know what things will happen that will we just don't always understand because of our own choices let alone God it appears unfair when adversity strikes especially when it isn't our fault sickness and disease and death is no respecter of persons Going back to Job, Job 14, 1, Job says, Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of troubles. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. We're here for a short time. And it can be very difficult at times. And we just don't always know why, but we're going to fade like a flower, like a leaf. Hebrews 9, 27, it's been appointed man wants to die. After this, the judgment. None of us are going to get out of here alive. We're all very terminal. Natural disasters, again. Jesus speaks about natural disasters being exactly that, even when he gives these analogies that a wise man is like the man that builds his house upon, upon the solid rock foundation. The foolish man is a sand. But you know what he's understood? He says, then here comes the rains, here comes the winds. Because I want to ask you, do storms come? That's just a part of, of, of what life is. And so there's going to be disastrous situations. And then there's times that there's affliction and persecution. That because we're doing the right thing, because we're standing up for the truth, we're saying the things that honor and glorify God, that we're not afraid to show our faith to the community. Let's have our march for righteousness and goodness and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And see how we'd be ridiculed for that. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yes. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But no matter what's going on and what appears to be unfair in this life, life can seem unfair as we just looked at. Time and chance happen to us all. Then there's Satan encouraging us to blame God, to accuse God of wrongdoing, to accuse God of wrongdoing that we might curse him and eventually die, die condemned, as the devil wants us to do. That's why he's called the devil. That's why he is diabolus, the accuser, the slanderer, the malignant, malignant enemy of God as he accuses man to God and God to man. Vine ex it defines diabolus exactly like that. My friends and brethren, to accuse God of all adversity is tantamount to cursing him. When we just accuse and blame God for the, the difficulties, the problems, the wicked. The, I heard somebody say that, that, well, it's why God created evil. I do not believe for a moment that God creates evil. Evil is the result of man's wrong choices. Again, there is a difference in what God directly does as opposed to what he allows. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? There is a difference in what God directly does and what he allows. So there's something very, very paradoxical as we close all of this. And this is going to kind of be the conclusion of the day and will be a sad way to next Sunday. But there's something very paradoxical in suffering because God says, there are blessings in suffering. Opportunities to make us better people. We go back to the book of James. In James 1, 2, and 3, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know what that is all about? A 
perspective, our attitude. Our attitude. Our attitude when adversity strikes. So next Sunday, if Lord wills, we're going to look at the positive side of suffering. Brethren, let's be very careful not to automatically assign culpability, blame to God whenever adversity strikes in life. We must take life as it comes and remember, even as the wise men concluded, as you see me in the conclusion of your outline, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This is man's all. So regardless of the circumstances in life, and there are a lot of circumstances, but how is the Lord going to find us? We're going to sing an invitation song. Will the Lord find us watching, waiting, waiting when he returns, no matter what happens to us in this life? If we can help assist anyone in any spiritual need that you have, communicate that. Let us, let us know. Why don't you come at this time? We stand and sing the song. That is possible.